Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's really, really great to be here. It's a real humbling experience to be here. Um, it's a real humbling experience to go this late in the program simply because you've been having such a good time. I've been warned not to mess it up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I have a lot to share with you, and I'm going to speed through it. And hopefully Bjorn will do a fantastic job keeping up with the translation. Uh, but just in case you miss anything or have that burning desire to share what you've experienced with others, you can just go to raceinthepreset.com or .org or blacksinthescriptures.com or .org or 1978revelation.com or .org. You can go to just about anything on this subject and you will get to our websites and our videos, which you can share free of charge. Um, we provide them free of charge. You share them free as well. Don't charge people. All right. So um, with that in mind, uh, I love this topic, and I'm really grateful to have my family here. Uh, I am really grateful to go after Sharon. And uh, let me tell you what I think about women. I think women are the greatest thing on this earth, the greatest beings here. Um, I am grateful that we get to share this planet with them. And what's interesting is that all of us as embryos start off, I mean, as, as women, we're all female first, and then we get pushed into. So uh, women have an ultra high place in my life, and um, I am constantly looking up to the women in my life, including my wife and my daughters, my mothers, my sisters, and my dear friends. So uh, women, I love you. All right, so um, let's talk about our, our goals for our time together uh, to provide answers to some of the most pressing questions in the church, uh, not only today, but for the last 100 years. Uh, most of the things that members believe they know on this subject is just actually not correct, but what you'll find very interesting is the correct answers are all right there in your scriptures. And so I'm going to give you a little precursor, a little, uh, a little warning here. Don't believe a word that I have to say. Seriously. I, I mean, I, I, I love to help and I want to be able to uh, give you a perfect knowledge, but I can't do that. A perfect knowledge can only come through the Holy Ghost. And so the best way for all of us to learn truth is to study what's been given and then use the relationship you already have with God to pray and find out through the Holy Ghost what is true. That is the way to obtain truth. And so also uh, we want to help you to have a greater reliance upon the scriptures and the Holy Ghost as well. And um, become one. There are many walls uh, that have divided the human family, and uh, we're going to help tear some of those down. Um, we're going to do this by shattering some of the long-standing paradigms you might have had, in addition to uh, providing some of the tools to help you to effectively help others into the church. Um, uh, one of the questions was about can't do much without a calling. Um, we have an outreach program of 50 coordinators in the U.S., and we have several in other countries. We are part in helping to baptize several hundred people per year into the church, and this is, has nothing to do with a calling. This has everything to do, like with Scott and his passion for FAIR and, uh, and, and those others that just do because they have a passion and desire and feel inspired by the Lord. We're also going to utilize the scientific, the social, uh, basically to help you to have a better understanding of the scriptures themselves. And one thing that you're going to find is that all things testify of Christ. All right. So with that in mind, let's start with the plan of salvation, the very simple plan. All right. We started as uh, spirit children and our father, loving father, he wanted us to have all that he has. So he designed this plan. And in this plan, if we chose to take part of it, we got bodies, got a chance to come here to earth to be tested and to uh, accept the testimony of Christ and also then to get the ordinances um, of the priesthood uh, through the temple. Those ordinances would allow us entrance into our Father's kingdom, all right? And so the priesthood and temples is essential to the entire plan of salvation. So if you restrict the priesthood, in essence, you've restricted the entire plan of salvation. It is of none effect. 
in the lives of the people who you restrict the priesthood from. So you have to understand the key, the importance, the essential nature of priesthood in the plan of salvation. It's what it's all about. You go down, get those ordinances, I'll get, uh, to get you back into my presence where I can get you everything. All right, so <clears throat> this is the most important building or a representation of all the temples in the world, but the most important building on the face of the planet in the plan of salvation because this is the building in which we get those ordinances that the whole plan of salvation was supported and surrounded, uh, set up on. Now, for the first 22 years of the church, we gave priesthood to all men. And then in 1852, unfortunately on my birthday, February 5th, 1852, so I always say I was born to do this work, um, uh, we turned and we started doing something different, all right? And so we created a policy. So what we did is we created a wall, a wall that blocked entrance, a wall that blocked the plan of salvation in the lives of people of color. And that's when the prayers began. Uh, this is the only reason we're here. And so that wall created, that, that policy created a wall. Now there were several people, not only people of color, but other people within the church that were really kind of bothered by the change of why we are now doing just the opposite of what we did for the last 20, the first 22 years of this church. And so there were teachings created to justify what was doing, uh, what we were doing now. That actually became uh, the second wall. And these walls, these teachings, as you can see, uh, popping up on the screen, if anybody who's done any research on this subject at all has seen these teachings uh, that were shared. Now, when you teach these things to a group of people over a long period of time, what happens to their attitudes toward the people that are on the other side of that wall. Well, those created, it created a third wall, actually. The people learned to hate the people of color. They learned to despise them, not teach to them. They learned to think that they were, uh, whatever was there, or their, their uh, fate was their fault and their doing. And so those attitudes created a third wall. And then, what do you think people of color and others outside of the church Think about a church that teaches, that has such a policy, that has such teachings, and has such attitudes. Well, that actually created a perception outside the church that we were racist, that we worship some other kind of God because the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is teaching that he is. And so that created these perceptions that just really put up a strong fortification. So we have these four walls of restriction on priesthood. Now, uh, people think that uh, only include the men in that conversation, but you have to understand, if you understand the basic plan of salvation, the priesthood essential to getting the ordinances that get us back into the presence of the Father, then what that means is that the women and the children were also restricted from the whole purpose that they were down here because temple entrance was blocked, certain callings were blocked, they wouldn't preach to people of color in many places. So women and children have to be included in this conversation when we start talking about restriction. So in 1978, we did some demolition. All right, so a wall came down. Rejoicing, rejoicing, everybody I talked to, they remember where they were when this happened, and so many saints rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. So let's go back uh, and take a look at our temple and the uh, walls. And so 1978, that's 136 years we've had these four walls in place. And then the policy came down. But as soon as the policy came down, we stopped talking about it. We didn't go back and we didn't correct the teachings. And so not only did the teachings remain, but they even started to take a different shape. While well, only the uh, Levites had the priesthood in uh, the um, Old Testament, which wasn't true. And uh, just, just more of those things. So they actually fortified the walls of the teaching 
which actually fortified the walls of the attitudes. Yeah, we really, even though we changed the policy, we had a right to have those attitudes, and it actually fortified the perceptions. People outside the church really became even more convinced of how wrong we were because of these things. And so, brothers and sisters, until we take down those other three walls, the restriction is actually still in place. And that's part of why we're here today. And this is part of why we teach this all out throughout the world is those teachings are actually found in your scriptures. And we're going to, hopefully what you're going to do is study the things out that we share today, get your own testimony, and then share it with everybody you know. Social media, everywhere you go. I, everybody, every place I go, I talk to somebody, especially if they're a member, and we cover this. And my family, they see missionaries. I, I have to change the way my family sees missionaries because right now if they see a missionary, they're like, oh, no. Okay, because they know I'm going to talk to them. They know I'm going to teach them. And we're gonna, because we've got to change the teachings because the attitudes won't change until the teachings change and the perceptions won't until the teachings and the attitudes change. All right? So uh, let's talk about uh, the white shirts. So uh, just as, this is the audience participation part of the presentation. So can you tell me what color this good missionary shirt is? White. Now, we went to science class. What's on the opposite end of the scale? Black. Okay, so if we were to gradually go through that scale and stop in the middle, what color would we have? Gray. Absolutely. Now tell me, what color is his face? Well, if his shirt is white, his face can't be white because they're two totally different colors. And so one of them has to be white. You tell me which one, though. Which one's white? Okay, the shirt. Okay, so what color is his face? Pink. As you gradually darken it, what color does it become? <laughs> if I embarrass him, it comes red. Yeah, absolutely. But um, uh, ta tan, brown, absolutely. It be, he's actually just a lighter shade of brown. Um, um, my kids say, well, if there were really black and white people, they would have gray babies. If they... <laughs> okay. And so, and, so, and, so, and so, as you look at my, uh, the brother on the right, what color is his skin? All right, so if we're all shades of brown, that should be a paradigm shift for you, okay? There are no black and white people. We're all just different shades of brown. So if there are no black and white people, how do we start calling each other black and white? Well... We've got white shirts and we've got brown people. And this is a German brother by the name of Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. And in 1775, he was graduating from med school. And he actually created the whole concept of race. And he gave the coloring scheme black, white, yellow, red, and brown. The scientific community was so fascinated by his, uh, his paper, his doctoral dissertation, that they published it. If you look him up, you'll see that he is noted as the father of scientific anthropology. So he is the reason we call each other black and white. You've been lied to. There are no black and white people. Um, let's talk about how skin color actually changes. All right, so what's beautiful about the Lord is he put the largest organ, organs react to their environmental conditions, he put the largest organ on the outside of the body so that it could adapt to its environmental conditions as we moved about the earth that he created for us. How cool is that? So as you take a look, the orange represents the melanocyte inside the skin. You're going to have a constant there, which is the melanocortin 1 receptor. It is just sitting there waiting to fuse. And once our temperature changes, something happens. If we're in the hot climates, then the Lord commanded the body to produce the melanin-stimulating hormone. When it fuses with the melanocortin 1 receptor, it produces this eumelanin, which is the darker brown melanin in the skin represented by the, uh, represented by the red and black up there. But it's really brown, the darker brown. And that's why we tan, because this fusion has taken place. When it's really cold outside, like when we moved out of the hot African climate and we start moving into Europe and Scandinavia, well, very little sun, our bodies needed to synthesize and process, process vitamin D. And so the Lord had to take the natural sunblock down. He did that by causing the body in those conditions to produce the agouti signaling protein. 
Once the agouti signaling protein fuses with a melanocortin-1 receptor, it produces what's called the pheo melanin, which is the lighter melanin we have in the skin, bringing it down to keep us alive so we can process vitamin D so that we won't die. Seems like a loving God. So, what's interesting about it is if you look at the skin color map, and this is provided by the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, you can see the science and this map actually work out. So the darker climates are in the hotter places, the darker skin colors. Now take a look at where Lehi and his family would have been. Take a look at where Jesus would have been. So we really got the Lamanite skin color right, we just didn't get the Nephite skin color right. <laughs> Nephites never went to Europe. Okay. So I wanted to just sit here to let that set in for a little bit, and then we're going to give you some scriptural support for that as we move on. All right, there's a black and white person. Ever seen anyone look like that? Okay, so if you haven't, then what you have to do is something that's going to be really difficult for you. You have to stop lying. You have to stop using the words black and white relative to man because there are no black people. Every time you, a covenant people who have covenanted to take the truth forward, every time you use the term black man, white man, I'm white, I'm black, he's black, I knew a black guy, uh, you know, all my family is white, I don't know why I'm so black, I don't care what it is. Every time you use those terms, you're lying. You're putting a brick of deception on a wall that makes people believe that there's actually something different. All in the human family are alike, 99.99% alike. We're all shades of brown. And every time you see someone with a different complexion, it should make you smile, saying the Lord loved us so much that he put the largest organ on the outside of the body so it would adapt as we moved about the earth. It is one of the signs, one of the greatest signs of the Lord's love for us. So we have to stop using those terms. And as we stop we can share that message with the world and get them to stop as well. And guess what? You see the walls start coming down. Black and white are walls that divide us. There is no difference. There is a picture of the human family and its glory. Isn't that beautiful? All right. Let's talk about an idiom. All right. Idioms. So my kids love idioms, and uh, it's fun because most of, the, a lot, most of the time we're doing this, we're in the United States, and we're looking for uh, someone that is not born in the United States. Is there anyone here that was not born in the U.S.? <laughs> oh, okay, I, just about all of them, girls. Okay, so, so um, in that case, why don't we use a Swedish idiom? And help me if I say this, uh, this wrong. Uh, Dit ligger hun graven. Is that is that? Hold on, let me. I, I have to. I have. I have to check my reference. Oh, dit ligger hun begraven. Is that better? Okay, beautiful. So, uh, can you tell the Americans what that means? I'm sorry. The direct translation would be something like, "There's a." Uh, there's a dog in it, or there's a dog buried. Okay, and Americans have any idea what that means? Okay, yeah. See, see, we're turning the tables on the idiom. Basically, an idiom is uh, here's the dictionary definition of it: the construction or expression of one language whose parts correspond to elements in another language, but whose total structure or meaning is not matched in the same way in the second language. Or you can simply say, uh, that doesn't mean what I think it means. It means something totally different in another language or culture. Okay? And so this uh, it, Swedish idiom that I just uh, put forth, there, there's a dog buried. Some, say, somebody's not telling you the whole truth. There's more to the story. But when you translate that directly into English, us Americans wouldn't have known what that meant. And so if you don't understand idioms and the use of idioms, then there's no way for you to understand ancient scripture. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Uga was talking about not being able to, you know, DNA proof and not proof of the Book of Mormon. Idioms prove that the Book of Mormon is an ancient document. And you'll see that as we go through this presentation. Now, once you do that, we ask our friends and neighbors to actually pray about it 
to see if it is truly divine, but we can easily, pr easily prove that it is an ancient document uh, through idioms. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to cover a few things. There are widely accepted views, uh, which I call the doctrine of men or the philosophies of men in the church, and we also have the actual doctrine, which is the scriptures. So a lot of people ask me, and forgive me all the scholars in the room, have you read this book? Have you? It's like the book that I read the most uh, is the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine, Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Those are the books that I read the most, simply because I want that iron rod experience. There's a lot of stuff that's out there, and it's absolutely phenomenal and tremendous, but when I want to understand truth, I want to go straight to the iron rod, which are the scriptures and my knees. All right, so, and by the way, I have bad knees. That means I pray a lot. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what a curse is. So uh, most... We use this word a lot in the church. As a matter of fact, when I was investigating the church, people were lovingly telling me that I was cursed, that I, that I could not get into the celestial kingdom, but I should join anyway. Uh, there were blessings for me. And I am so confused. I'm looking at them like, you know, where I grew up, this was generally the start of a fight, but you're saying it's so nice, I'm confused. I don't know what to do with this. And so... Um, Anyway, I, I'm amazed that the word is used so frequently, yet so few members even know what an actual curse means. And it is laid out very nicely in both the uh, Webster's Dictionary, where you can see definitions number 9 and 14 uh, talk about an ecclesiastical censure, which is basically a, a separation from the church or to excommunicate. Uh, but it's also laid out pretty well in our scriptures as well. In uh, DNC 2941, this is in reference to Adam. And Elder Bednar talks about when you do scripture studies, look for patterns. We're going to do a lot of work with patterns today. And so it reads, Wherefore I, the Lord God, cause that it should be cast out from the Garden of Eden from my presence because of his transgression. Now, a curse is a separation from God, his path, or his ways due to sin. I teach on one of the most sensitive subjects in the church throughout the world, and I have to have the Spirit with me. So when I sin, the first thing that happens is a separation between myself and God, a cause by me because I chose to do Satan's work. Okay, there's only two works in the world. You're either doing God's work or you're doing Satan's work. There's no in-between. And so I've lost the use of the Spirit, the companionship of the Spirit, and how can this distance affect skin color? It, it doesn't. You just learn something about skin color that should help to understand that it has nothing to do with cursing. A cursing is a separation from God, his path, or his ways due to sin. How do I remove this curse? Absolutely, I repent. I repent, Lord, I'm really sorry for what I've done, uh, and I, I demonstrate to him that I really want to do his will, and then I can have his spirit to be with me again. So that's what a curse is. Look for that pattern uh, relative to Adam. We think about his son Cain being cursed. Yes, he was separated from God it's because of his sin, uh, but so was Adam. Wherefore, I, the Lord God, cause that he should be cast out from the Garden of Eden from my presence because of his transgression, wherein he became spiritually dead, which is the first death, even that same death, which is the last death, which is spiritual, which shall be pronounced upon the wicked when I should say, depart ye cursed. All right. So with that in mind, let's go to the Bible. The book that I use for conversion, as a matter of fact, one of the things that pains me to no end is when I hear members um, talk about the Book of Mormon like it's the only book of Scripture out there. That actually causes others to believe that we don't believe in the Bible. You've got to stop that. The Old Testament is our foundation. The New Testament builds onto our foundation. The Book of Mormon builds onto that foundation as promised in the Old Testament and in the book of Isaiah. And so if we're only talking about one of the books, we're basically weakening our position. Now, what else are we doing? Well, the Bible is the greatest tool that we use for conversion and helping other people to understand the truthfulness of the gospel, simply because it's the common bond. Our neighbors don't have the Book of Mormon. They only have the Bible for the most part. And so when we show them how well we not only know the Bible, but how great a story the Bible tells, the LDS version of the King James Bible, 
Um, it makes an awful lot of sense, and now they want to know more about the Book of Mormon. So it's all about how we're using the tools that are available to us, and the scriptures, in my mind, are the most powerful. So take a look at Jeremiah 8:21. What we did with the Blacks and the Scriptures Project is we actually took every word, every mention, every form of the word black in the scriptures, and we compiled them, and then we separated them. These dealt with buildings, these dealt with animals, these other objects, these dealt with man. And those that dealt with man, we actually really prayerfully went through those uh, very thoroughly. And you're going to see most of them right here. We found something that we think you will actually love and can use, because we're using it successfully to bring many souls unto Christ. Uh, Jeremiah 8.21, for the herd of the daughters, my people, I am herd, I am black. Astonishment have taken hold of me. Now, before reading this, we would think they were talking about black people, but we know there's no such thing as black people. We also know there's no such thing as black skin. We're all brown. Blumenbach created that whole thing. But look at what you find only in the LDS version of the King James Bible. This may not be in this. I don't think there is a Swedish version of the LDS Bible or Norwegian, is there? I couldn't find it. All right, but in the U.S. version, the, uh, the American version of this, it, there's an idiom, uh, there's a footnote that says that this is a Hebrew idiom that doesn't mean what you think it means. It's talking about the spiritual, emotional, or mental state of this individual, not the skin. And it just says that it's a Hebrew idiom meaning gloomy. Same thing in Jeremiah 14.2. Judah mourneth in the gates thereof language, they are black unto the ground. Only in the LDS version of the King James Bible will you find another clarifying footnote that tells you that they're talking about the emotional, spiritual, or mental state of that individual. We move on to uh, Joel 2.6. In Joel 2.6, before their faces, the people shall be much pain. All shall gather blackness. Again, this footnote clarifying footnote letting you know that they're talking about the mental, spiritual, or emotional state of that individual is only found in the LDS version of the King James Bible. If you're not using the Bible as a conversion tool and a missionary tool, you are missing gold. You're missing absolute gold. What I do is I, I, I have my neighbors or my critics or those who want a Bible bash, I said, well, go, go get your Bibles. Go get your Bibles. Let's, let's, yeah, let's do this. And we go right here. We start with these same ones that I'm showing you, and they, they, they leave scratching their head or becoming investigators. Um, uh, uh, so Joel 2.6 tells you that it's a Hebrew idiom, and then you do the same thing in Nahum 2.10. You got them all gather blackness. Look at this, Hebrew idiom meaning gloom. All this time we thought black in the scriptures dealt with the skin color of the race of an individual, and uh, it's been there right there in our Bibles. If we understand Hebrew idioms, we know that they use that word talking about the mental, emotional, or spiritual state of the individual. So, now let's go on to Job 3030. This is really key, especially those missionary-minded, because it talks about a skin of blackness, which so does the Book of Mormon, and they're trying to get us to change our doctrine because it sounds really racist, and it's like, well, you really just have to understand it. And it says, my skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. Now, the first question I'll ask you, was Job black? No, because there are no black people, right? All right, so Job was brown, just like all of us. He was living in a hot area, so he would have had a protection, a, 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 a darker tone to protect him from the hot sun. But what was interesting about the other Bibles that have been changed, the uh, NIV and the other versions that our friends and neighbors use, is that they've actually changed the word here to make it sound like there was something wrong with Job's skin. And we know there was something wrong with his skin because he was having boils, but that's not here. That's not what this is talking about. And then that's what I tell them. Well, that's, they're actually talking about Job was feeling really dejected, spiritually darkened, and everything else because of everything that was happening to him. He was gloomy. And that makes sense, all the problems Job was experiencing. Um, but your Bibles have changed it to make it sound like there's something wrong with his skin. And it's even believable because we know there was something wrong with his skin. And so that's why the Lord said not to add or take away. And then you should see their faces. It's like, no, that's what we use against you. You can't use that against us. 
And so I said, no, well, this, that's what it really means. Because not only does the Lord say it in Revelation, but we also have it in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. And so if it meant what you think it means, we wouldn't have any scripture after Deuteronomy chapter 4. So let's move on. Lamentations 5.10 says the same thing. Our skin was black like an oven because of a terrible famine. So just by a show of hands, who turned black last fast Sunday? <laughs> okay, so how about our spirits were a little gloomy and darkened because there was a famine going on. Does that sound a little more reasonable, like it fits? Really, really understand idioms. You can't understand ancient scripture if you don't understand idioms. So let's move on to the most criticized scripture. <laughs> I, get, uh, I get a Google alert on this every day uh, with this particular subject. Uh, uh, they're criticized in 2 Nephi 5.21. Now what's interesting, now that we understand idioms, if you read this passage, you've got 10 idioms in one passage of scripture. And he calls a cursing to come upon them, Yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness, and I missed one of them, to come upon me. So I missed one in there somewhere, but there's ten idioms in this one passage of Scripture. So if you don't understand idioms, can you imagine how many idioms are in the entire Book of Mormon? If you don't understand idioms, you, 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 can't, you cannot understand what the, what the Book of Mormon is speaking about, or the Bible for that matter. So what's interesting about this is that there are new footnotes placed on your scriptures in 1981 edition of the scriptures, leading us that to putting one on the word skin and taking us to 2 Nephi 30 verse 6. And Scott pointed to this one a little earlier, uh, and it says, And they shall rejoice uh, shall, because they shall know that it is a blessing unto them from the hand of God. And their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a pure and delightsome people. That used to say white and delightsome. And uh, Joseph Smith actually did change that in 1840, and there were two accounts as to why he changed it, but it never got it into the Book of Mor uh, into the changes because the next edition that was changed was done with the uh, brethren that were over uh, uh, in England, uh, in Europe, uh, building the gospel over there. But there are two accounts. One said that it more accurately fit what was meant, and the other said that he feared the saints would misunderstand its meaning. Sounds like they did. But what's interesting about this is the footnote placed on skin in 2 Nephi 5.21 brought us here to have a better understanding of what is meant by skin. And if you follow the brand new footnote they put on the word scales, you'll see that they say clearly that it was darkness, spiritual, spiritual blindness. So the Lamanites never had a darker skin in the Nephites. First of all, they were talking about a spiritual darkness. And second, the Nephites came over here with a dark skin as well. They never looked like, uh, we, we, we didn't look European until we went to Europe. All right. <clears throat> so uh, how about Jacob 3.8? Oh, my brethren, I fear that unless you shall repent of your sins, their skins shall be whiter than yours when ye shall brought, be brought with them before the throne of God. And what's interesting about this one is this one talks about, this is actually talking about polygamy. They're talking about plural wives and concubines. And the Lord is saying, no, these guys are sinning by doing this, and their skins are going to be whiter. Well, uh, what happens when we're brought before the throne of God? We're judged. Is he going to judge us on our physical appearance, our skin color? No way. We know that. He's going to judge us on our sins. So the skins being spoken of support everything that we've read so far in the Old Testament and to the Book of Mormon as skins being spiritual. All right. Um, let's move on to 3 Nephi 2.15. And their curse was taken away from them. Their skin became white like unto the Nephites. I get this a lot. Oh, Brother Perkins, how are you going to explain that one away? It sounds pretty racist. And I said, well, again, if you understand uh, uh, ancient scripture and idiom, it doesn't, it doesn't sound racist at all. You, you know they're talking about the spiritual state of those individuals. Uh, and as they remove, remember, remember me and, and my curse scenario? As I remove the curse, 
My skin, my spirit became brighter because I had the light of Christ in me again. I didn't have that before, that spirit. It, 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 I had dimmed it because of my sin. But also, if you follow the new footnote they put on the word white, it takes you to the three passages of Scripture we just covered. 2 Nephi 5.21, 2 Nephi 30, verse 6, and Jacob 3.8. All right. How about Alma 3.4? I love this one because they're talking about three groups of people and how they distinguish themselves, and if their skin color was different, why would they need to distinguish themselves? Okay? So, and the Amlicites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked their, themselves as red in their forehead after the manner of the Lamanites. Nevertheless, they had not shorn their heads like unto the Lamanites. So you've got three groups of people. You've got one group of people, I still have my hair and no tattoos. You've got a second group of people, I still have my hair, but I have a tattoo. And then you've got this third group of people. I've shaved my head and I have a tattoo. And that's how you tell all of us apart. All right? So even more support of that is going to Alma 55, verse 8 and 9. Now, this is, you'll know this story. This is where Moroni was, uh, had a bad negotiations with uh, the king of the Lamanites to get prisoners back. And so he went and devised a plan. He said, hey, let's go find a descendant of Laman amongst our people. All right, and they caused this search to be done. And if they had a darker skin, why did he have to search for them? Okay. So they find one. His name is Laman. They go, and um, they have wine, and they take it to the Lamanites. Now, based on the knowledge you probably walked in here with, as soon as the Lamanites see them, they're going to know they're Nephites. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> And when it was evening, Laman went to the guards who were over the Nephites, and behold, they saw him coming. So they can actually see them. And they hailed him, but he said unto them, Fear not, behold, I am a Lamanite. Well, if he can see him, why did he have to identify that he was a Lamanite? Was he telling the truth? No, he wasn't. He was a Nephite. Okay, he was a descendant of Laman, but again, as Ugo touched on earlier, it was a belief system. Lamanite, if you believed in the church, you were called a Nephite. If you didn't believe in the church, you were called a Lamanite. That's how they separated. So members of the same family, you could have two brothers that would be, two brothers could be a Lamanite and Nephite, like Laman and Nephi. Okay? I still think that's funny. It's not even funny in Norway, girls. Uh, or Sweden, I'm sorry. All right, so, well, I'm sorry. Let's see what, how this works, though, uh, how this finishes up. Fear, I'm, I'm a Lamanite. Fear not, behold, I'm a Lamanite. Behold, we have escaped, so acknowledging everybody that's in the party from the Nephites, and they sleep. And behold, we, again, acknowledging everybody in the party, have taken of the wine and brought with us. So this is the part where the Lamanites should say, we can see your pale faces. But instead they say, now when the Lamanites heard these words, they received them with joy. So here they are drinking wine and being happy and excited in the presence of, in the presence of uh, Nephites. They can't even tell they're Nephites. There was no skin color changing in the Book of Mormon. Second uh, Nephi 26, 33. Now this is great because the Lord knew... <sighs> In the book of Acts, it talks about a restoration of all things in preparation to the second coming. And so whenever the Lord restored the fullness of the gospel, he had to restore it in a certain place to a certain people at a certain time. No matter where he chose to do that in the world, it could have been here. There was going to be some type of problem those people were experiencing. And so he chose to do it through a prophet named Joseph Smith uh, in New York, uh, in the United States, in the 1800s. What did we have going on there at the time? Slavery. A great inequality of man. And so the Lord knew we were going to have that problem. He actually gave us the answers in the scriptures to help us to understand what these words black and white meant and what they didn't mean. Now... We don't need footnotes for this one. He gave Joseph a beautiful trio of scriptures that help us to understand what we've just studied. Uh, and this is the most misquoted mem uh, scripture by members trying to prove that the church is not racist, and you know it. And he invited all to, I'm sorry, uh, and he invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, 
and he remembereth the heathen, and all are like unto God. So what does the black and white mean? We, we've used this to say black people, but we know there are no black people now. We know Blumenbach created that whole thing. We know that we're all different shades of brown. We're just all brown. So what's interesting is that if 2 Nephi 5.21 told us that this is talking about a spiritual darkness and a purity with the, with the white, well, if those idioms are correct, then what that means is that these are the same idioms that, were being, that we covered in Jeremiah and Nahum and Joel, which means that Joseph Smith couldn't have possibly have written the Book of Mormon because... Doctrine Covenant section 1 verse 24 tells us that he wrote after the manner of his language, which was English. The only book of scripture that we have written in English after the manner of our language, the English language, was the Doctrine and Covenants. It says it in the first book of the book of instructions for building the restored gospel. And so what that means is that this is an ancient document because it has consistent idioms as the Old Testament. Joseph Smith couldn't have possibly have written this. Now watch this. As we go, remember the words of Elder Bednar when we talked about patterns. Let's go to Alma uh, 1 verse 30 and 11 verse 4, uh, 1144. You're going to see the exact same pattern with the words black and white substituted for other words. Bond and free, male and female, uh, both old and young. Bond and free, male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. There's your replacement for black and white. And then in Alma 1 verse 30 whether out of the church or in the church, they're tucked in that exact same pattern. So with that trio of Scripture, we can tell two very powerful things, that the Lamanites never had a darker skin than the Nephites. They were always talking about a spiritual darkness. And these idioms are consistent with Old Testament idioms, which means Joseph Smith couldn't have possibly have written the Book of Mormon. This is proof that the Book of Mormon is an ancient document, at least in my mind. Let's talk about priesthood. Um, most don't know that the priesthood was given to all men uh, in 1830, uh, when the church was first restored. Um, here's just a small list of some of the men of African descent who held the priesthood. <clears throat> what you'll find interesting is that the priesthood restriction started in 1852, yet Enoch Abel, the son of Elijah Abel, was ordained to the priesthood in 1900, and in 1934, his son, named after his grandfather, Elijah Abel, uh, was ordained in 1934 as a priest and 1935 as an elder. Remember the key and how important priesthood is. Um, who qualifies for priesthood? We've uncovered at least 12 direct commands to Joseph. Joseph was not building Joseph's church. He was building the Lord's church. He didn't seek after it. He was just trying to find out which church to join, which one should he join. And the Lord came and said, I'm going to do a mighty work through you. And through this mighty work, he gave them. Joseph had to pray for everything, every instruction on how he builds the Lord's church. And with a great inequality of man, he prayed about this issue over and over again. We receive, we've uncovered at least 12 direct commands for Joseph to give the priesthood to everyone who would embrace the gospel. And here are the qualifications for priesthood. Uh, and faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Who is eliminated from this list? Those without faith, hope, charity, and love, and with an eye single to the glory of God. Those are the only people who are, who, who, who are excluded from this, uh, you know, from priesthood here. If you follow your brand new footnote that you'll find on the word qualify, you'll see topical guide priesthood qualifying for. How about another direct revelation given to Joseph Smith? Now, in, in the scriptures, something is called either a calling or it's called a commandment. This is the only place in all of Scripture that is called both a calling and commandment. And it's in Doctrine and Covenants section 36, verses 4 and 5, and it reads, And now this calling commandment give I unto you concerning all men, that as many as shall come before my servants, Signe Rignan and Joseph Smith, Jr., embracing this calling and commandment, shall be ordained and sent forth to preach the everlasting gospel among the nations. Pretty clear. 
The clear guidance is repeated in Doctrine and Covenants section 6357. Again, it's at least 12 times, but uh, because of the short time we have, I'm only going to cover a few. Um, we have uh, scripture reference guides on our website. We've got more thorough coverage in the videos on our website that you can find again at uh, uh, raceinthepriesthood.com or org, 1978revelation.com or org, blacksinthescriptures.com or org. Uh, and again, verily I say unto those, uh, say unto you, those who desire in meekness, I'm sorry, those who desire in their hearts in meekness to warn sinners to repentance, let them be ordained unto this power. So it's been there in front of us the entire time. And these require no footnotes to understand um, that the Lord had intended for all who would embrace the gospel to be ordained to the priesthood because, remember the plan of salvation? It's the essential ingredient. All right, and let's see. Uh, this is all confirmed by the Race in the Priesthood article uh, in 2000, uh, December 6, 2013 where the church basically, it, through the essay, tells us that it was the racial attitudes at the time that uh, the restriction was in place, and they disavowed the teachings of the past. So we have to get the other three walls down. In conclusion, I just want to say that, uh, you know, you just have to keep in mind that the race and the term black and white were created uh, and made world popular. They were used prior to that, but it was made world famous by Blumenbach um, in uh, 1775 when he wrote it, 1776 when his work was published. Uh, black and white in the scriptures refer to the spirits of man. They have nothing to do with skin color because there are no black and white people. You know how skin color changes. And we've been taught that it is a curse and a sign of something bad when it's actually a sign of the Lord's love for us. Um, idioms. you got to understand idioms if you're going to understand Scripture. And idioms help to prove that the Book of Mormon is actually an ancient document. Uh, a curse is a separation from God. His ways are his path. And there's several direct revelations to give all men the priesthood. So, with that... I close and tell you how much I absolutely love this gospel and the opportunity that I have to teach and to share uh, that that the Lord has given me. And uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, and with that in mind, I'll take any questions you might have. And no question is off limits. Why do you think the 1852 policy came? Um, I'm 100% certain, uh, it's not a think, it's a thought, it's a testimony that it came because of the racial attitudes that were in the country at the time, that simple. Uh, and that is also supported by the Race in the Priesthood uh, essay that was published on LDS.org. Um, what are your thoughts about why it took so long for the prophets to change the practice so late in 1978? Um, why not Revelation earlier? Well, you have to keep in mind, um, and I'm going to say this a little harshly. It might come out a little harshly just to get through it quickly. Everybody in the country was racist at the time. Even the abolitionists, who were the best in the country, they didn't even want to free all the slaves at once. And those that were free, they didn't want to give them all the rights at once. They wanted to try them out with a few and see how that worked out. I mean, that's awful when you think about it in our day. And so everybody was racist at that time. And this 1852 policy... What it actually did is institutionalize racism in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it gave them what they thought was a divine right for the weakness that they were bringing in and they, were, they had to overcome. And so if that was the case, they didn't start trying to outlaw racism in America until the 1960s. And so it was about 100 years before they even start trying to address the problem and you try stewing in some soup for a hundred years, those thoughts are going to be just so well embedded into the fabric of the church, it's going to take a little while longer to get it out. I mean, and just remember, we saw the same thing in the New Testament. We, here we have the resurrected Savior who has shown these guys everything, and the very last command he gave them was to take the gospel to all the world, which included the Gentiles. But they refused to do it because their hatred for the Gentiles was so deep that they just they, they had laws that made it illegal for them to even come in contact with them. And so man's heart doesn't change overnight. It, it's something that takes time. How would you explain that prophets um, 
um, ex Brigham Young being racist in their talks about African descent. Uh, it's really easy. Everybody was racist in the country, and um, they just. Uh, if you read Doctrine and Covenants section one, verse twenty-four through twenty-eight, it says, "I know they're going to make mistakes. Uh, I know sometimes they're not going to seek me. I know they're going to sin." And, yeah, and when they do, it'll be revealed, it'll be made known. You gotta keep in mind, this is a church of continuing revelation, and we were given a huge task to a few people. I mean, just imagine if you and a few of your closest friends in the ward were asked to go start a, another church or a church or, 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 or something that you've never seen, something that has never been here, uh, you know, hasn't been on the earth in your lifetime. How daunting would that task be? There were going to be some mistakes made, uh, as the Lord pointed out. And again, if the Lord knows they're going to make sin, uh, going to sin, make mistakes, and sometimes not seek Him, I I've got to be okay with that. So, um, would you like the church to apologize for how they treated African Americans from 18, and why don't they? Uh, here's my thing: as long as you know who you are. No apology necessary. There's no apology that the church could ever make that's going to benefit me because I know who I am. If the church apologizes, that when I repent, when I repent, that repentance is for me. That's for my benefit. And so I want the church, I know the church has a lot of things going on, and I have to worry about not only my salvation and what I'm get, getting my sins right, but I have to worry about what I can do to help other people into the gospel so they can have everything that I have. And so we'll, I'll let the church worry about the church. I'll worry about Marvin. Um, Wilford Woodruff stated that God would never allow the prophet to lead the church astray. How do you reconcile that with the priesthood ban being policy? Well, uh, someone said it earlier. I can't remember who it is. Everything the prophet said was not true. I don't believe that to be a true statement. But most of the members do. And so they've gone on to a statement, and I'd like to start asking, hey, did you pray about that and get a, t a spiritual confirmation that that was true? Everything the prophet says is not true. And so if they say something and it's not true and you base your whole testimony on it, that's what the uh, Savior called a sandy foundation. So I've never bought into that, that that statement was true. Um, you can ban the priesthood, a policy, why do we have statements from prophets in the First Presidency calling it doctrine? Um, uh, Bruce R. McConkie said it really well in August of 1978 um, uh, when he said, forget what I said, or President Brigham Young or George Chu Cannon or whoever has said in the days past is contrary to today's revelation. We spoke with a limited understanding. See, if we held... Um, if, if, if we held ourselves to the same standards that, uh, of perfection that we held the prophets to, um, I think we would better understand how they can make mistakes. I don't, again, my thought is I'm not, uh, <laughs> um, I am not uh, chastising anybody for their sins simply because mine are so many. And my wife can tell you that she can verify that. Okay. Uh, what would Cain's mark be? That's an easy one. It was spiritual darkness. Uh, temple blessings can be given in proxy, right? Uh, yes, they can. All temple blessings, yes, they can now, uh, but they weren't before. There were people, as a matter of fact, uh, Elijah Abel was washed and anointed in the Kirtland Temple, but uh, when the endowment house was built, they refused to allow him to receive his endowment. So here's a man that held a priesthood, served already two missions for the church, and they wouldn't let him have uh, his... Thing. How am I doing with my five minutes? Three minutes left? <laughs> uh, okay, I'm trying to take the short questions here. Uh, what about the drawings in light and dark people? Um, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can understand that one, but it's talking about light and dark people and drawings and so on and so forth. I can't really speak to that. Well, you, again, if you watch the first segment of Blacks in the Scriptures, Blacks in the Bible, you're going to find drawings of uh, light and dark people as well. We're just all different shades of brown. you got to get that. You know, in my family, uh, my brother was called Coffee Bean because he was so dark. 
And, uh, and my parents are both African-American, uh, but uh, my brother was called Coffee Bean because he was so dark and I was so light, they called me Mellow Yellow. And so within, there were six of us and you had all different shades in there. Skin color just has never mattered. It, uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord really points it out clearly that you know he, he was chastising the prophet Samuel, saying, don't do that, I don't do that. I don't look on the outward appearance. The outward appearance should not be, you, you should live by 1 Samuel 16. 16, 7. Outward appearance has nothing to do with anything other than where your parents spent the most time. I haven't heard that black Africans didn't get priesthood because it was a special past in heaven who didn't ordain priesthood in preexistence, right? Uh, I, I, I hope I'm answering this when I say uh, it was taught that people of African descent would not get the priesthood because of the... Um, uh, lack of valiance in the preexistence. We wouldn't take a side. Uh, that was just one of those explanations that they came up with trying to justify what they had already done. And it went directly against the uh, commandments that you read in the Doctrine and Covenants. Remember, if the Lord gives a command, then everything else that goes against that is wrong. I mean, it's really, really simple. It's, 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 it's black and white. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. I've got two more. Do we have time? I don't want to impose. But thank you. They're really long. Um, wow, this one's two pages. All right. When reading about skin in the Scriptures, Book of Mormon, can we, ref can we perhaps think of skin of the heart as the Scriptures talk about the circumcision? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what they're talking about. They're talk Again, your heart is going to determine... Um, I'm trying to teach my, my, my gorgeous kids, um, you know, I can tell what's important to you. You don't even have to say it. I can tell just by what you do, what you think about, what you say, how you carry yourselves. And uh, they are tremendous, and they get that, and they understand that. This circumcision of heart, a absolutely, because your, where your heart is is going uh, to determine where your feet point, and where your feet point is going to determine how much of the Lord's Spirit you uh, maintain. All right, the last one is President Kimball spoke of the skin of the Lamanite children in the homes uh, placement program being lighter than their brothers in the restoration. Uh, Kimball believed uh, this is evidence of, for the Book of Mormon. Uh, what are your thoughts? on this, uh, if the case was not really about skin, how come prophets taught it? Again, Church of Continuing Revelation, remember Elder McConkie's, we spoke with a limited understanding. Uh, they just didn't know. I mean, we really, really have to give them a break. So think about it uh, in, in context of yourselves. Uh, you're here to learn, right? You're here to learn. You don't know everything. And you've been in the church for how long? Probably a lot longer than uh, the early leaders had the church. And so, again, I think our best selves, our best selves are those who can go out and gather something and then bring it so the whole house can, I mean, just like bring it into the bishop's storehouse so everybody can feed on it, on that knowledge. And so uh, let's focus on, and, and most of these questions, most of these questions are member curiosity questions. Um, I don't really care that much about member curiosity questions. I care about the questions that are going to help our neighbors come into the church. They don't care about that stuff. They care about our doctrine and what the doctrine says and what it means. And as long as we can explain that, that's where I pray that our focus would be because if we can explain that, we can experience. I mean, our outreach team is part of several hundred baptisms per year just by teaching the scriptures. And we never even talk about church leaders and mistakes made. It just never comes up. That only comes up in a Q&A. We only talk about the scriptures. Thank you. I love being here with you guys. <laughs>